Hello everyone! Earlier this year, Valve blew everyone's minds by revealing that they are actually releasing a game. Counter-Strike 2, a free update for Global Offensive, brings the series to the new Source 2 engine, along with a general graphics overhaul and a multitude of new features, the most notable of which being the extremely innovative smoke grenades. These smoke grenades are a legitimate volume that lives in the world. They grow to fill spaces and respond to bullets as well as explosives. Needless to say, the game dev community was astounded. Tons of indie developers took to their game engines to try and recreate the effect, but no one was getting it quite right, so fine. I'll do it myself. Before we get into things, let's hear a word from the channel's first ever sponsor, Manscaped. Manscaped is trusted by more than 8 million men worldwide for their grooming needs, myself included as I have been using their trimmers for years. Manscaped is now offering a new performance package that bundles all their best products into one easy order. The first item in the package is their premier trimmer, the Lawn Mower 4.0. Its ceramic blade is designed to reduce accidents and it has an LED attached to help see where the sun doesn't shine. Then we have the Weed Whacker 2.0 for easy nose and ear hair trimming, a deodorant and toner for your balls to help fight that boy smell in the summer, a nifty travel bag, a shirt, and what surprisingly ended up being my favorite product, the Manscaped Anti-Chafing Boxers. Seriously, I didn't even know I had a chafing problem till I wore these and my discomfort disappeared. Once again, all of these products are bundled in Manscaped's Performance Package 4.0. Go to manscaped.com today and get 20% off plus free international shipping when you use promo code ACERolla at checkout. Thank you so much to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to the smoke. As always, the first step of any case study is to study the case. Valve's reveal trailer for the smoke gives us a lot of insight as to how the effect might be working, so let's start there. Smoke grenades now create volumetric 3D objects that live in the world. The narrator specifies that smoke grenades create volumetric 3D objects. Volumetric is a very important keyword in graphics programming, and it implies a lot about the potential underlying algorithms. The next big observation is the cube-like structure of the smoke. These cubes rapidly expand from the smoke grenade until they reach a set distance from the origin. Let's also take a look at the developer window. Well, someone at Valve needs to work on those parameter names. But this setting is important. It confirms that these strange cubes are in fact voxels. More on that later. This next setting is strange. Draw only emitters could have a few meanings. Emitter is usually used in the context of particles. Anything that spawns particles is referred to as a particle emitter. A very popular technique for faking volumetrics includes stacking a lot of particles on top of each other. This could imply that Valve is using that technique. But if they are, then the smoke is not actually volumetric, and the narrator would be lying to us. So I am going to instead assume this means voxel emitter. Now, the hallmark of this tech is how the smoke interacts with the environment. The smoke grows around obstacles instead of clipping through them, giving the appearance of a legitimate fluid. These are not the only interactions, though. Shooting the smoke puts holes through it, and grenades blow away the smoke temporarily. The last, very important obstacle observation is that the smoke is being rendered at quarter resolution. But Ace Rolla, how do you know the smoke is being rendered at quarter resolution? Well, that's between me, God, and NVIDIA Insight Graphics. NVIDIA Insight Graphics is a program for profiling and debugging game graphics. It works by hooking into the game's graphics API, and now every time the game makes a graphics call, like a draw call, it goes through the profiler before going to your GPU. This allows us to later complete completely reconstruct a frame of a game by executing those exact same API calls again. With a captured frame of a game, we can look at every single API call, how long it took to execute, the resources attached to that call like textures or constant buffers, as well as decompiled shaders. This might seem like cheating, but it still doesn't really paint a full picture as we are missing out on the entire CPU side of things. Instead, it helps us confirm a few important technical specifications of the smoke grenades that we would otherwise have to guess. 
CS. A hero in my Discord server provided me with several captured frames of CS2 to investigate, so let's take a look at a frame that contains two smoke grenades. This bar up here is the profiler. It shows how long each event took to execute. We can see two large bars here. The first one involves the rendering of all the geometry in the scene. The second one is the smoke grenades. The smoke takes almost as long to render as it took to render all of the geometry in the scene, so whatever technique they are using for the smoke is very expensive. If we take a step back, we can see that the smoke has no mesh. Instead, they draw the bounding boxes of the smoke, and then in one single post-processing pass, all of the smoke is rendered. The last important thing to note for now is the resolution of the smoke texture. It is 480 by 270, a quarter of 1920 by 1080, which was the resolution this frame was captured with. That quarter resolution texture is then upscaled and composited with the final render. Now, let's recap everything we know so far. The smoke is referred to as volumetric. The smoke is composed of voxels, which expand around objects as the smoke grows. Somehow, bullets and grenades can remove the smoke temporarily. All of the smoke is rendered in a single post-processing pass and not as an instanced draw call of particles. The smoke rendering is very expensive, even though it's rendered at quarter resolution. All of these facts point to one very common, yet very expensive technique called ray marching, the premier method for legitimate volumetric rendering. Unfortunately, we can't do any ray marching or volume rendering until we have some voxels. But what actually is a voxel? Formally, a voxel is a value on a three-dimensional grid. The word voxel is analogous to the word pixel, with vo representing volume and l representing element. Thankfully, everyone watching this video is already familiar with voxels because of Minecraft. Minecraft could be thought of as one big three-dimensional grid, the blocks being the result of the voxel values. A value of zero in the grid means nothing is there, while a value of one could mean it is a dirt block, or a value value of 2 could be wood, for example. In this context, the voxel values are an index for a lookup table of potential materials, which is fundamentally how every voxel-based game is rendered. Fortunately, this is already more complicated than what we need. For us, we only care about three cases, if the voxel is empty, if the voxel is occupied by an obstacle, or if the voxel has smoke in it. How simple. But Ace Rolla, what's the catch? The catch is that the memory cost of voxels very quickly becomes absurd. Modern video games have complex environments filled with high-fidelity 3D models. To get an accurate representation of these scenes, we would need a very high-resolution voxel grid that stretches across the whole world. The grid would then need to be updated every single frame to account for stuff that moves, which is not possible at all for obvious reasons. As an example, a 128 cubed voxel grid is already over 2 million voxels, and each voxel is 32 bits, meaning this tiny grid costs us 8 megabytes. It would not be possible to store an accurate voxelized representation of an open world game in memory, even if it was divided up into chunks. Thankfully for Valve, Counter-Strike 2 is not an open-world game. The maps are small, and the geometry is all pretty simple. Even so, their smoke voxels are very large to keep the memory cost as low as possible. Moving over to Unity, I have a little test environment set up that I need to cover with a voxel grid. This plane is 30 by 30, so we create a bounding box centered about the origin with extents 15 by 2.5 by 15. To get the resolution of our voxel grid, we multiply the bounding box extents by 2 to get the full perimeter of the box, and then divide by the voxel size we want. I think the CS2 voxel size is 0.5, so our voxel grid resolution ends up at 60 by 10 by 60 for a total count of 36,000 voxels. We then create a compute buffer of 36,000 elements and send it off to our GPU for some compute shaders. Just to make sure we did it right, let's initialize the grid to 1 as if the entire grid is filled with smoke. We can debug our voxels by instancing cubes equal to our voxel count. Voxels are convenient in that their position in the world is easily derived from their position in the grid, but the problem here is that our voxel info is stored in a one-dimensional buffer. Instead of a 3D position, we have an index from 0 to 35,999. This means we need to convert our one-dimensional index to a three-dimensional position in the voxel grid. This position is in voxel space. To get world space, we multiply by the size of our voxels and subtract the bounds extent of the grid. We add these world positions to the vertices of our instanced cubes with random colors and we can now see the voxels. 
Now that we have our voxel grid, let's try recreating that smoke voxel animation from their trailer. As a quick recap, the voxels rapidly expand out from the origin of the smoke grenade, and then the growth quickly slows down. I'm not going to implement physical grenades, I'll just spawn some smoke on mouse click. We cast a ray from the camera until it collides with some scene geometry to get a world position origin point. Then we want to fill in every voxel in the grid that is within a certain radius from that origin. The radius will determine the shape of our smoke. We could use a sphere, but the smoke in Counter-Strike 2 is wider than it is tall, so it's probably an ellipsoid. To check if a voxel is within our smoke radius, we first calculate the world position like we did earlier, and then subtract the origin of our smoke grenade. If we divide the position by the radius of our ellipsoid, we can calculate the Pythagorean distance, and if it's less than 1, then we know the position is inside the smoke. This gives us our voxelized smoke shape, but it's not animated yet. When we spawn on a new grenade, we want to start a timer. We use the timer to linearly interpolate between zero and the max radius so that the smoke grows over time. As it turns out, linear growth almost always looks terrible, and it also doesn't look anything like Counter-Strike's growth. To remedy this, we want to make use of an easing function. Easing functions are used in animation for non-linear growth. It is a function that takes in our linear timer as a value between zero and one and outputs a new value between zero and one to use as our interpolator. A simple easing function is the quadratic ease out, also known as x squared. This already looks more interesting than the linear growth, but it stops abruptly. The secret sauce for easing functions is that they don't have to be just one function. They can be a Frankenstein monster of piecewise functions. If we combine two quadratics at the midpoint, we can smoothly start to grow and then come to a smooth stop. But these aren't enough to satisfy the growth behavior of the CS2 smoke. Remember that the smoke smoke quickly expands and then slowly grows afterward. To replicate this, I am going to break the rules a bit. My easing function will take in a value between 0 and infinity instead of 0 and 1. After an initial burst of growth, the function will slowly approach the max radius as time goes to infinity. We have our smoke voxels! But obviously they can't interact with the environment yet. In order to do that, we need to voxelize all of the geometry in the scene. But now that I think about it, I don't even know how to do that. Hello everybody, and welcome to the first episode of Bake Story, presented by your host, Casarola. This may come as a surprise, but baking is actually a major part of the game development process. In the context of games, baking is any kind of pre-processing done at build time to avoid having to do those computations on the fly. The beauty of baking is that the algorithms don't have to be fast enough for real-time computation, we can take our time to create the best results possible, which is why AAA studios have bake processes that can take several days to finish. On today's episode, we'll be baking a voxelized representation of the static geometry in our test environment. You might be wondering, Chef Rolla, why would we want to bake this? And the simple answer is, because we can. The objects in the scene aren't going to move, so it would be a pointless waste of resources to calculate their voxel representation more than once. All we need for this recipe is the voxel grid and the triangles of the mesh we want to voxelize. Every voxel in our grid needs to be compared with every triangle in the mesh to see if they overlap. To do that, we will utilize the separating axis theorem. The theory states that two objects do not overlap if there exists a line in which the two objects' projections don't overlap. Basically, if you look at the two objects from a certain direction and they don't overlap, then the two objects cannot be intersected. To make extra sure the voxel and the triangle intersect, we'll look at them from these 13 directions. That's all we need, so let's start baking our scene. While we wait for that, let's acknowledge that 13 projections for every triangle of the mesh for every voxel of the grid turns out to be a lot of work. And when some models can have hundreds of thousands of triangles, it becomes obvious why we are baking our voxels. This overwhelming workload, combined with the memory cost of the voxels themselves, is why we haven't really seen high-fidelity voxel-based systems in games at all. Oh, it looks like our voxelized scene is finished baking. Well, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Now that we have our voxelized scene, all we have to do is check if the voxel is filled in already, and not draw smoke there while growing the radius. Well, 
That didn't work at all. Our smoke propagation logic has a bit of a problem. Even though smoke voxels aren't appearing inside geometry like we want, when the radius expands beyond objects, then voxels will still pass the radius check and get filled in. This means we need to get a bit more sophisticated. When we check a voxel, what we are actually looking for is the distance of that voxel from the origin. Our world space radius check assumes there are no obstacles in the way. To get a distance that accounts for obstacles, we could use a pathfinding algorithm algorithm like A star or Dijkstra to calculate the shortest path from the voxel to the origin, but this would be very expensive. Instead, let's invert the logic with an algorithm called flood fill. Flood fill is an algorithm for filling in connected areas of a multi-dimensional array. If you have ever used the bucket tool in Photoshop or Paint, then you have used this technique. The algorithm starts with a seed point, and then, for each step afterwards, we check if an empty node is the neighbor of a flood-filled node. If so, we fill in the node. We stop when every connected area has been filled in. To seed our voxel grid, we need to convert our world space origin point to voxel space by modding the position by the bounding box extent, adding the extents to the position, dividing by the perimeter of the bounds, and then multiplying by the voxel resolution. Once our grid is seeded, every frame we update the grid such that any neighbor of a filled-in voxel gets filled in. Obviously, we still want to keep it within the bounds of our radius, though. Now that the smoke only grows from existing smoke voxels, we are close to the behavior we want. When a wall completely closes off bits of the smoke radius, then no voxels appear on the other side. But, if only one voxel can sneak through, then everything gets filled in. We can very easily solve this by limiting the number of maximum steps the flood fill can take. When we seed the voxel grid, instead of setting the value to 1, we can set the number to something like 16. Then, when we fill a voxel in, we set its value to the maximum neighboring value minus 1. This way, the voxels will eventually run out of gas and stop expanding. The limited flood fill gives us the behavior we want. The smoke now wraps around obstacles, but it doesn't expand forever. It's important to note that this is my solution to the problem, and Val's propagation is most likely more sophisticated, but I got the job done. Everything is now in place to turn our cubes into smoke, so let's learn a little bit about ray marching. Imagine you had a glass box, and this box was filled with a bunch of dust particles. Now imagine you are looking through the box at Molly Rankin, lead singer of Canadian jangle pop band Always. How would you determine how much the particles are obscuring your ability to see her. The amount of light that a volume absorbs is referred to as its transmittance. A transmittance of zero means no light goes through, and a value of one means all light goes through. A simple model for volumetric transmittance is called Beer's Law. Beer's Law states that the transmittance of light through a volume is equal to e to the negative distance times density. This means that the farther a light ray has to travel through a volume, the less light gets transmitted. The rate increases or decreases based on the density. Our glass box dilemma would have an easy solution if the density was constant, but it's not. It varies depending on where the particles are most concentrated. If we were to graph the density of the particles over distance, it would look something like this. And in order to get the total density, we just need to calculate the area under the curve by integrating the density function. That's right! Next time someone complains about how they never used the math they learned in high school, remind them that they could use those skills to estimate the transmittance of light through a volume. Unfortunately, in this context, we don't have an exact density function. All we have are a bunch of particles floating around in a box, so we can't do an exact integral. This is where ray marching enters the game. Ray marching involves iteratively traversing a ray, effectively dividing the ray up into small segments to sample a function. Imagine we projected a ray out from your eyeball through the box. At each iteration of the algorithm, we want to take a small step forward, sample the density at that point and add it to a density sum. We repeat this process until we exit the glass box, and the result is an estimation of the total density between you and Molly Rankin. If we visualize this technique on our graph from earlier, it might look a whole lot like a Riemann sum, uh, because it is. This means we should multiply our density sum by the size of our ray steps, which would be dx in the integration formula. Returning to the context of the smoke, the camera is our eyeball and the voxel grid is our glass box. 
Unfortunately for me, Molly Rankin is nowhere to be found. For each step of our march, we evaluate our density function, the voxel grid, by converting our position to voxel space and getting the voxel value. And then, once we're done marching, we calculate the transmittance with Beer's Law to produce an alpha map that we can blend into our final render, just like Counter-Strike 2. One problem though, our smoke is getting drawn on top of everything. This is because we aren't checking if our ray march has exceeded the scene depth. If our position has gone past the value in our depth texture, then we want to stop marching. That way, our smoke is properly obscured by existing objects, and we don't waste resources on what won't be visible. What's that? It doesn't look like smoke? Well, that's because we're missing one crucial component of volumetric rendering, the shadows. At the moment, we aren't actually calculating any lighting, only how much light the volume is absorbing to obscure our vision. To get shadows and details, we need to figure out how the sun is illuminating our volume, or in more specific terms, we need to calculate the outscattering of our smoke. The outscattering of a volume refers to how much light is reflected or scattered outwards. It is similar in concept to diffuse lighting. To calculate this outscattering, we need to figure out how much light energy was lost due to absorption by the time the light ray reached our sample point. This means we do the same thing we are doing from our camera through the voxel grid, but from the sample point to the light source. Our algorithm will now work like so. Each step into the volume, we sample our density function and compute the transmittance at that point. Then, we do a ray march towards the sun to get the transmittance of the light source. We multiply the sun transmittance by the color of the sun and the base transmittance and then add that to our output color. The farther the point is from the light source, the more light gets absorbed and the less the light contributes to our final output color, which is what creates our shadows. We repeat this process until we exit the volume and when all is said and done, we have a shaded albedo texture for our smoke in addition to our alpha texture, just like CS2. But what's that? It still doesn't look like smoke? Okay, since when did you all have such high standards? Fine. We'll add some noise. When it comes to rendering volumes, there is one kind of noise that rises above the rest known as Worley noise. Worley noise is named after Stephen Worley, who introduced the algorithm for its construction in 1996. This form of noise is similar to Voronoi and is used for a wide variety of textures like stone and water and is also useful for faking caustics. It might not immediately be apparent how this noise could be used for volumes like smoke or clouds, but once we invert it, then the the cloud-like structure becomes obvious. If we take a look at our frame capture from earlier, we can see that the two smokes blend together where they collide. This is not the result of some complex fluid simulation, but instead the result of the two smokes sampling the same noise texture that tiles across the world. If we take a look at the textures bound to the smoke render pass, we can see the noise texture they are using, a 3D Worley noise texture. Their texture contains four channels of noise, two Worley noise textures, and two textures of what I assume is curl noise. Curl noise is used to fake turbulence, and it's really good at it, but I am not going to go over curl noise because everything in this video I had to build from the ground up, and I just didn't have the time to write a curl noise generator on top of everything else. I will definitely cover it in the future though. Generating Worley noise is fairly simple. We randomly distribute a bunch of points on a texture, which we'll call feature points. Then, for every pixel in the texture, we find the distance to the closest feature point and set the pixel to a value between 0 and 1, where 1 is on the feature point, and 0 is pretty far away. Lastly, we invert the result to get the cloud-like texture we want. This process works the same for 2 and 3 dimensions. I have created a 128 cubed texture to store the Worley noise in, just like CS2. Now we just have to apply the noise in the same way as CS2. Thankfully, I know exactly how Valve is doing it. How do I know exactly how Valve is doing it? Well, that's between me, God, and the Horizon Zero Dawn real-time volumetric cloud rendering SIGGRAPH presentation. When it comes to real-time volumetric clouds, Guerrilla Games basically wrote the book. Horizon Zero Dawn and its sequel boast insanely good-looking cloudscapes that are rendered entirely in real-time to support the different kinds of clouds, varying cloud coverage, and rain clouds. To keep it short, Horizon renders its clouds by having one low-detail noise texture that creates a base cloud shape and one high detail noise texture that tiles to add realistic details to the edges of their clouds. The lighting is determined in the same way I presented earlier, their noise texture contains Worley noise and curl noise, and it's also rendered at quarter resolution. So it's safe to say that while Valve deserves high praise for the mechanics of the smoke, 
joke, it is ultimately Guerrilla Games that deserves the credit for the visuals. The only difference here is that instead of a low detail noise texture creating the bass volume shape, it is our voxel grid. To get the noise to only affect the edges of our smoke, we want to have the density fall off the further it gets from the smoke origin. First, we calculate the normalized distance from the origin the same way we were doing earlier with the radius check and use it as our interpolator for a smooth step between the minimum density falloff and 1. Then we multiply our density by 1 minus that result. This results in a pleasant ellipsoid shape and the voxels have disappeared. Well, no, they have not disappeared. If we look at the smoke when it has propagated around an obstacle, then... the voxels are still apparent. This is because these voxels are still close to the origin, despite being on the opposite side of the wall. To fix this, we need to do our density falloff based on the voxel distance from the origin. Thankfully, due to my genius implementation for smoke propagation, we already know the voxel's distance from the origin since it is encoded into the voxel grid during the flood fill steps. If we use the max distance between the two and calculate our falloff from that, then the problem almost disappears. To to get a smooth gradient, we need to do a trilinear sample of our voxels, which, while more expensive, gives us a decently smooth falloff. Applying the noise is then as simple as sampling the noise texture and adding it to the distance. As you can see, the edges of our smoke now have variance. What's that? It still looks bad? Okay, I'll have you know that this is a realistic lighting model you're looking at. You people have no appreciation for the models used to describe the world around us. Fine, fine. We'll add some more artistic parameters. In the real world, different particles interact with light differently. Some particles will absorb more light than they reflect, others will do the opposite. To account for this in our lighting model, we declare two constants, the absorption and scattering coefficients. The sum of these two numbers is referred to as the extinction coefficient, which we multiply with the density because the more light that is absorbed or scattered, the less we will be able to see through the volume. The scattering coefficient will determine how much outscattering occurs, a higher value will result in a brighter final color with more obvious shadows. While we're talking about outscattering, I should go over one final detail. When a particle scatters light, it doesn't always do it equally. Some particles might shoot light rays equally in all directions. This is known as isotropic scattering, but some particles might scatter rays in a specific direction known as anisotropic scattering. The function that determines the direction light is scattered in is known as the phase function. Many different phase functions exist, such as Rayleigh, Henye Greenstein, and me. For stuff like clouds and smoke, an accurate model would be me scattering, since those particles like to shoot light forward. But this is bad for gameplay, since the smoke will look very different depending on your angle of view. So instead, I'll be using Rayleigh scattering, which shoots light out equally in all directions. To calculate Rayleigh scattering, we take the cosine of the angle between the camera ray and the direction of the light source, and then send it through this equation. Then we multiply the result with the light contribution we add to our color each march of our ray. With these changes, we can now model many different kinds of volumes, not just smoke, all from different absorption and scattering values, multipliers on the density, as well as the different phase functions and subtle changes to the Worley noise. And while we're at it, let's check the performance. Oops, I forgot that we're still rendering the volumetrics at full resolution. If we instead render at quarter resolution, the frame rate increases dramatically, with surprisingly little difference in appearance. The visuals of the smoke are finished! Now, we just need to put some holes in it. Alright, I will be totally honest here, it is a complete mystery to me how these bullet holes work. It is some black magic. I have here a frame capture of a smoke that has been shot through. If we take a look at the textures bound to the render pass, we can see... That's right, a texture that has the shape of the hole baked into it. Somehow, this texture is what drives the visuals of the holes, regardless of which direction you look at the smoke. This whole project took me a little over a month, and the entire time I was thinking about how this texture could possibly be used for cases in which you are not looking at the smoke directly head on. Unfortunately, I never got any ideas. Hopefully Valve does come out with their own presentation on how this all works, but before then, only they know. 
so instead, I will be taking a naive approach to the bullet holes with the magic of signed distance functions. A signed distance function, also referred to as an SDF, is a function that returns the distance of a given point to the surface of a shape. They return a positive value when you are getting away from the shape, they return zero when you are on the surface of the shape, and they return a negative value when you are inside the shape. It's like a fancy version of hot and cold. Ray marching and signed distance functions go together like Harold and Maud. In fact, this video is quite the anomaly, as usually you learn about ray marching because of signed distance functions, not the other way around. So it makes sense why I am reaching for them here to create bullet holes in our ray marched smoke. Pretty much every primitive can be modeled as an SDF. For instance, a sphere SDF looks like so. We would render this sphere in the same way we render our smoke. We iteratively march over a ray, checking our sphere SDF at each step. And if we detect a collision, then we know we have reached the sphere. For the bullet holes, I will be using a round cone SDF, which is a little bit more complex than the sphere. The reason I am using the round cone is because the radius gets progressively slimmer based on depth, which is exactly what we want our bullet holes to look like. The round cone is constructed from two points. For us, these two points will be the camera position when the bullet is shot, and the second point will be a given distance from the first point in the direction of the camera forward vector. In order to render our bullet holes, we need to now check the SDF each time we evaluate the density function in our ray march. If we're inside the bullet hole, then the density should be zero. This results in some very unpleasant visuals. To make it look better, we will apply the same density falloff logic that we used for the shape of our smoke to make the bullet holes smoothly transition. We also get the noise offset for free since we are already sampling noise at every point. What a bargain. We can adjust the radii of our cone points to get the shape we want, and now we have to animate it. The animation logic is no different than our smoke radius animation. We start a timer when we shoot the bullet and put the timer through an easing function. Obviously, we want to use a different easing function though. The one I have chosen quickly expands to the max radius and then slowly goes back to zero, as if the smoke is filling the hole back in. At this point, we only support one bullet hole. In order to have many bullet holes, then we need to have the CPU keep track of our active holes. Let's construct a compute buffer to allow up to 128 bullet holes, and then every time we shoot a bullet, the CPU will add that origin and timer to a list and ship it off to the GPU. Each frame, the CPU will update the timer and radii of the holes, and update the compute buffer again with the new info. If a hole's timer has surpassed one, we remove it from the list. On the GPU side, we now iterate through every bullet hole SDF and find the minimum distance. This may sound really bad, and I always mention that we do not want to move data from the CPU to the GPU every frame if we can avoid it, but the GPU is just not good at maintaining states like this, so we do what we must. Besides, there is no noticeable performance difference setting 128 values each frame. Unfortunately though, calculating several SDFs does have a noticeable difference. Spamming the smoke with holes completely tanks the performance and is not acceptable in the slightest, especially when you consider in a game of CS2 every player could buy a Negev and crash people's games by creating more holes than the GPUs can handle. This is where it becomes clear why Valve is faking their holes with mysterious black magic, because the alternative just isn't possible. But we can make it a lot better by only calculating the SDF distance in the base ray march and not in the lighting ray marches. This means that our bullet holes will not have proper lighting and will be flat shaded, which looks kind of ugly, but it's the only thing that sort of redeems my bullet hole solution. In the end, my smoke takes about 1 millisecond to render without any bullet holes on my 1660, which is technically faster than CS2, but they are definitely doing some more complex stuff to justify that longer render time. With bullet holes though, I'm taking the L on that one. Sorry for falling flat on that, and I hope Valve spills the beans on how they did it. While I only demonstrated one smoke grenade and bullet holes, the other features of the CS2 smoke should be easily extrapolated from what I presented in this video. This stuff just takes a lot of time that I do not have. Speaking of time that I do not have, thanks to your support, I am very excited to announce that I have quit my job at Sony, no I didn't get fired, and I am now a full-time funny internet man. If you would like to help me continue to be a funny internet man that is able to eat food and have a house, I would appreciate it very much if you supported me over on Patreon. All of my patrons get to vote on the topic for the next video, and while unfortunately the next video has already been determined, 
you'll be able to vote on the one after that. As usual, a huge thank you to my current patrons. Without your support, I would not have been able to achieve my dream of full-time content creation. Anyways, that's all from me. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next time.